Good morning, Salem. Hey, you know, in a lot of ways we are uh, just still getting acquainted, you know, I, I realize that. And uh, I, I will share one thing with you. Um, over the years, my wardrobe choices have uh, tended to be kind of in line with, with uh, pretty much like the rest of my life, fairly conservative. But some years ago, I indulged myself and I bought this tie. Now, you laugh. I was in Austin. I mean, give me a break. It's, <laughs> it's a little weird there. But, um, you know, I bought this tie and, and I was kind of excited about it. I, I was kind of excited about this tie, you know, not too conservative. And, and then I was back here in, in, in Houston and uh, it was Sunday and I was getting ready to preach and I went downstairs from my office and I ran into a guy in the hallway and man, man, I, I thought I had it going on, you know, I was going up to the platform to preach and I had the black pinstripe suit and the French cuffs working and I had my lace-ups on, you know, and I had the tie and, you know, I thought I'm, I'm, I'm looking pretty good and he, I ran into this guy who was wearing the same tie. <laughs> same tie. Now, when two guys are wearing the same tie, I, I do have to point out for you, this is not quite the same level of epic tragedy as two women wearing the same dress. Okay, I mean, it's, we, we don't, yeah, but I, so I, I, I just looked at him and I, I thought, I was like, hey, Rick, I complimented him on his good taste. Yeah. And the guy was, he was a lobbyist, actually, and he replied, you know, Vince, only people who talk for a living can get away with wearing ties like this. And that startled me for a moment because I never really thought of myself as someone who, who talks for a living, you know? How, however, I mean, think about it, I guess a fair description. Certainly pastors like uh, lobbyists do a lot more than, than just talk. But the truth is, uh, many, many of the most important things I do involve talking. And much of what I do involves words. In fact, virtually everything I do involves words. Mark's gospel says that Jesus came preaching, preaching and teaching, and he sent out his followers to preach and teach. And I think over the years I've gained a sense of the power of words because I've seen what they can do. You know, I, I've seen the power of words hurt people. I've seen people hurt by unkind words or unwise words, some of them my own, I have to confess. But I've also seen people built up and empowered and blessed by wonderful words. Wonderful words that have been spoken to them. Helpful words, positive words, and I hope some of those are things that I have spoken as well. But in spite of all that, sometimes I do think I, I underestimate the power of words. I, I forget about the power of words, even though I'm a guy who talks for a living and does a lot of writing. Maybe it's because I use words so much. Maybe I use words so much that they start to lose their meaning. Maybe they get a little glib, you know, and we, we just toss them around lightly. Words can come so easily that I think they can lose their impact. And then people don't really hear what we're saying. Today I want to give you some insight into the power of words, some very specific words. The Christian faith lives by the words of the gospel. And I'd like for us to reawaken the power of some words, particularly words Paul wrote to the Romans. He had these in mind when he wrote to the Romans in chapter 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you declare with your mouth, right? Declare with your mouth. So you actually have to speak it. God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. And then it goes on and it says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth, there we go again, mouth again, words going, whoop, words that you profess or proclaim, speak it again, your faith and you are saved. Profess your faith and you are saved. How many of you had the experience of going to the doctor because you had to get something checked out? Like, like maybe a, a strange bump or a sore or 
a part of your body that just didn't feel right and you had to go to the doctor and the doctor ordered up a scan scan of some sort maybe you haven't had that experience but maybe your parents have or a friend has a scan a test maybe a screening blood test maybe a biopsy and when you call to get your results or they call you to come in and get your results what is the one word that you are really hoping you don't hear cancer yeah that's a very very powerful word isn't it nobody wants to hear it that particular c word has got a lot of power dr samuel johnson once wrote when a man knows that he's about to be hanged in a fortnight it concentrates his mind wonderfully now cancer is certainly not a death sentence by hanging but it still tends to concentrate the mind, doesn't it? The mind of those who battle cancer. I've talked with people over the years who have battled cancer and they actually, actually struggle as well with a spiritual issue. They struggle with an identity issue as they try to keep themselves from becoming a disease to being someone, a person, who is struggling with a particular disease. A word that can do that that can impact somebody's identity like that has a lot of power. Another powerful C word is cure. Cure has a lot of power, doesn't it? When the doctor tells you that the cancer hasn't spread or that it is easily operable or that we can take this one out with a little bit of chemo or a little bit of radiation or it is somehow eager or easily treated Oh, we're excited. We, we long to hear that word, cure. Unfortunately, the word cure doesn't have the immediate impact as the word cancer, does it? Because cancer is a present fact, while cure is a hope and a promise for the future. And as a result, the immediate reality of cancer tends to undercut the future hope of a cure the future promises of a cure. But cure, that word, is still a, a very powerful word, and anybody who's battling any illness is eager to hear that word, cure. And then they're grateful when they do. So have I got you thinking about the power of words? Two words so far. Now I want you to consider two more words. Two words that are central to the Christian faith, which also have great power. And those two words are sin and salvation. Sin and salvation. Hugely powerful words. They actually, those two words sum up our faith, don't they? Right? We, but we can use them so easily that I think they can kind of lose their power. Particularly in the church, these can become like churchy Christian lingo. They can become preacher jargon. Right? And then we just, we just, we underestimate them. And then they, they sound like they don't mean so much to us anymore. They can lose their power. And we speak them effortlessly without thinking about them. And they become part of the in-house stuff. And then not only us tends to ignore them, but others as well. They mean even less to other people. Unlike cancer, unlike cancer, sin Sin is a universal reality. See, cancer only strikes some of us, but sin strikes all of us. It's universal. All have sinned, Paul says in Romans chapter 3. And the whole Bible, all of Scripture, underscores the reality of those words. We have failed to do what God commanded us to do, and we continue to do things that he's commanded us not to do. Right? We're like that. The record of human sin begins way back in Genesis 3 with the historical story of Adam and Eve and, and what happened there and how they chose to disobey God and then suffer the consequences. And even if you're somebody who sets aside Genesis 3, dangerous to do that by the way, but if you do that, if you set aside Genesis 3 and say, oh well that's not actually a historical fact, but I'm just going to look at individual deeds and, and words and thoughts and you know I'm going to judge people on an individual basis, well then you're ignoring God's word in Genesis 3, bad idea. However, you got to admit this, any reading, any reading of human life 
reveals the fact that we are all sinners. Sin is the universal human reality. Now on the surface, that might not seem so bad, right? If it's the universal reality, if we all suffer from it, well, we're all in it together, how bad can it be? We all know the kinds of things that get said to trivialize sin or to to justify our sin, right? I'm sure in the present circumstances, there are going to be atrocious things happening in Ukraine. And someone's going to say, I was just following orders when atrocities get committed. More, more locally, we might say, well, you know, I've sinned, but there were extenuating circumstances, pastor. Compared to everybody else I know, I'm pretty good. I'm not so bad. Or I was just trying to look out for, for me and my family. Or my favorite one in organizations, well, you know, sin, but we didn't really recognize that because we were just trying to keep the peace. And you know, if those excuses have any truth in them, can't be such a terrible thing, right? The fact is, sin is a terrible thing. Left untreated, sin will kill us. Sin won't just kill our our bodies like cancer will do if it's left untreated and something else doesn't get us first. Uh, Sin will kill our souls. It will kill our souls. There are no exceptions to this dreadful fact. Look at this. Jesus made made it so clear in Luke. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Don't worry about that. And after that can do no more. Can't hurt you anymore. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Well, that makes sense. Should I be afraid of the one who can only kill my body or what can kill my soul and throw me into hell? The grim and reality The grim and universal reality is that sin eventually casts us into hell unless some greater power intervenes, something more powerful than sin. And this is a lonely, very personal realization that people come to at some point in their life because many of our sins involve others. They involve others. But as Kipling's poem Tomlinson reminds us, The sins that we do by two and two that affect others, do with others, we pay for one by one. One by one. Now the second word, the second word I want to reclaim from here is infinitely more powerful than sin. It's the word salvation. Salvation, another S word, but this one is exponentially more powerful than sin. This is the very heart of the gospel. Sin is the bad news from the spiritual pathologist who has taken a biopsy of our souls and discovered that each one of us is diseased and each one of us will surely die. But salvation is the great promise of the great physician. The great physician promises us salvation. He assures us that we won't die because we'll be, he'll cure our disease and we will have eternal life. Against the universal fact of, of death and doom, God gave us the universal reality, the corresponding universality of grace, his grace. Our human problem is the same, but the solution is the same. The promise is the same. Death is the same. For all of us, death is the same, and life is the same through the power of Jesus Christ. But how do we leave death? How do we leave that behind and enter into life in Jesus Christ? It's very clear in Romans 10. It's crystal clear. The law is unable to do it. The law is unable to restore us to fellowship with God. We've broken it, and so it can only condemn us. But it also contains a word of great hope. It's the gospel word of Christ's death and Christ's resurrection for us. Paul points out in here in this chapter that in order to find salvation, nobody has got to climb up to heaven and bring Christ down. And he points out no one has to descend into the dead and lift Christ up. He's already died and he's already risen. 
On the contrary, Paul says there's a readily accessible word of grace. He assures his readers right here, 10 verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Do you believe it? Is Jesus Lord? Oh, that was weak. Do you believe it? Is Jesus Lord? Okay, let me hear it. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That ought to thunder. That is thunder that we need to hear. We, we need to never lose that. We have to always, always be hearing that over and over again in all of its thunderous power. If we truly believe that Jesus has died and has risen again for us to take our, away all of our sins, then we have new life. That is the only cure for the deadly disease of sin that leads to hell, which will eventually kill us all. But we have an absolutely sure cure for our disease. The New Testament is very clear about salvation. Jesus was not simply a nice guy. He was not simply a good guy who showed up and said, love God and love everybody. I mean, he said those things, but that's not all. That's not all he did. He did want us to love God and to love one another. But Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God who was incarnated, flesh put on. He was born. He was incarnated in a fully human Jewish dude. That's when he showed up, was born in Bethlehem, was raised and grew up in Nazareth, and then spent the last three years of his life preaching and teaching and traveling around and doing the incredible mighty deeds that we call miracles. And then his life seemed to end with the crucifixion, didn't it? It seemed like it, it was ended. He was charged with blasphemy. He was charged with sedition against the Roman government, and they killed him, killed him dead. But his life didn't end there. His life didn't end there. Acts 2, 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Our salvation rests on that reality, on the reality of the resurrection. If Jesus didn't survive the tomb, let's just go there for a second. If Jesus didn't survive the tomb, if Jesus didn't actually fellowship with the guys who had been following him before he was crucified, right? If, if that hadn't happened, then there's no good news. There's no good news to save us against the reality of sin and, and death. But the New Testament and the historic Christian faith tell us and prove that Jesus really did live again. Wow. In fact, the New Testament also assures us he lives today. He continues to live. And generations of faithful Christians have experienced his living power to bring new life. It's because he lives. Because he lives. He can be the healer of our souls. He can be that great physician who cures us, the spiritual physician who heals us from the deadly disease of sin. This is overwhelming reality. This is the powerful word of truth that we have to never forget. We have to hear it over and over again, and we can never let it grow stale. Now, finally, Romans reminds us in this section of the way that we hear this powerful word, salvation. We hear it from others, specifically the Christian community. That's what Paul has in mind when he asks down here in verse 14, how then can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? You see, we have to say it. We actually have to speak it. Clearly, nobody can hear about the negative consequences of sin unless we talk about it. No one can hear about the powerful and life-giving word salvation unless someone tells it. And ever since Jesus sent his disciples out into the world, out into the world to proclaim the good news of, what's that second S word? 
salvation. Ever since he sent us out, the disciples out to do that, preaching the good news, sharing the good news has been our assignment. Telling the good news is the work of the Christian community. It's our job, folks, not just us preacher types. It's our job to proclaim the importance and power of the word of salvation through faith in the crucified and risen and reigning Jesus. And then Paul goes on with just a little bit more. He quotes Isaiah, who said the messengers, the messengers, the people who share the good news of God's, of God's good tidings, well, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Hmm. Thursday, Pastor Jason asked how the sermon was going. I said, I think I'm, I'm about done. But then I read this thing about feet. Uh, what is that doing there? This, this last little bit, verse 15b. And then I got thinking, have you ever seen a truly beautiful pair of feet? Like beautiful on their own? I mean, like, I've seen graceful feet. On little kids, I've seen like cute, chubby little feet. Right? I've seen well-worn but still serviceable feet on working folks who, who labor. And I have seen gnarly feet. <laughs> I mean, face it. I mean, there's, there's like gnarly feet out there, right? But, but feet that are beautiful in their own right. I mean, I know the ladies go and they get petties and all that. And some of the guys do too, particularly in Austin, I hear. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but have you ever seen a, a truly beautiful pair of feet? What could make human feet seem beautiful? Well, it's the overwhelming beauty and magnificence of the good news that they bring. That's what it says. It's the splendor and beauty. The splendor and beauty are such that the body of the messenger, the very physical body of the one who brings that message, takes on enough of the beauty of the message to make even such unlovely human appendages as feet seem beautiful. They're beautiful because they bring the message of grace. They bring the message of our salvation. That's what makes them beautiful. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have promised us salvation. Salvation. A powerful word. A word that far surpasses the power of sin. It's a word that we as the community of believers, the community of faithful, are compelled to share with thunderous vigor, with big words, and to exclaim with joy. We're to share it with others. We can't keep it to ourselves. It's the only hope for our world which is universally condemned to death by the reality we refer to when we use that other powerful word, sin. Father, may we never lose our sense of the power of these two words. The one pointing to the desperate spiritual disease of humankind and the, off, the other offering your remedy through your son Jesus, incarnated, crucified, and resurrected so that we can have eternal life. Lord, strengthen our resolve to share the good news of salvation whose splendor is so magnificent that even though the feet of those who share it become beautiful. We pray this today in his most precious name and his people said, amen. Love you, Salem.